point, every other video is in a hotel room. This is, um, I'm in Espia, which is a few hours south of Oldberg. I took the train yesterday. It was a gorgeous trip. I played Stardew Valley the entire time. Great. We're going to be talking about renewable energy these next two days. Not only are we going to take a look at what actually happens in the renewable energy sector, I also have the opportunity to simplify some otherwise really complex issues for both you as well as for myself. So I hope that after this video, we all have a better overall idea of what's happening within the renewable energy sector, what are the benefits, what are the challenges as well, because I think that is also a really pressing issue. And what are some of the innovations that's currently happening? What are the advances and what are we doing? But first of all, let's look at some key numbers. 54% of domestic electricity supply is covered by wind energy in Denmark. And wind accounts for about 19% of the energy we consume in Europe overall. Solar panels are about 9%, hydro is 12%, wind is 19 nuclear is 23 and fossil fuels is still at 29 And then we have a category of other at around 8%. Europe has around 107,000 wind turbines, divided in 103,000 onshore and 3,600 offshore. And the vast majority of a wind turbine is made from steel, which account for 72% of its material. It also contains 13% iron, 11% fiberglass, resin or plastic, 2% aluminium and 1% copper, which makes 85-90% to 90 of a wind turbine's mass recycled. I made it to my pickup location, which is right by the harbor. And while we're going to be looking at renewable energy state, that's the main objective. This is also the Danish headquarters of Total Energies, which just celebrated their 101st birthday as a fossil fuel extractor. One of the biggest misconceptions about fossil fuels and the phasing out of fossil fuels is that consumers don't really have any other choice than to use fossil fuels and it's kind of our fault. One of the most successful lies by the fossil fuel industry and Total has been denying science since the 70s and tried to misrepresent the impact of using fossil fuels as less harmful than it actually is. There are many reasons as to why we need to phase out the use of fossil fuels altogether. The emissions, what it's doing to nature, biodiversity and natural habitats. Now we're looking into deep sea mining and that's just However, I do acknowledge that there are a lot of issues and challenges when it comes to the actual facing out of fossil fuels. I hope to learn more about this today. I was wondering about these massive constructions, but we'll get back to those later. For now, I've been taken on a guided tour around the harbor. So overall, the wind energy sector is a very immature industry. It's rather new compared to a lot of its counterparts like fossil fuels. So both when it comes to on and offshore wind turbines and the energy sector of renewables, there are some challenges that many consumers perhaps aren't aware of. We might think of the energy grid, we might think of how to store renewable energy so we can use it later to make it more predictable. We might think of the different technologies that are or aren't available and the innovations that are needed in the area. However, what I think a lot of consumers don't realize is that a lot of the challenges related to the renewable energy sector actually has to do not only with the sector, but everything around it. So producing wind turbines takes up an excessive amount of space because it's massive constructions. That means that you have to build in really, really large scales. Many of the main problems arise when you have to construct and transport a lot of these really big components. That means that around the wind-focused energy sector, we have to think about what kind of infrastructure is available to move these massive constructions. That means different kinds of trucks, different kinds of roads, that means different kinds of ships. And those are industries and sectors in and of themselves. So in order to scale and innovate and improve the wind energy sector, all of these other components has to be part of the journey as well. So one of the major challenges of the renewable energy sector when it comes to wind is when where we're going to put all of these components once they're produced. This means that one of the reasons why we aren't moving fast enough when it comes to the wind energy sector is because we don't have enough ports to store and transport them. So if we don't invest in port space or in transportation innovation or in road improvement, we can't get more renewable energy from wind. This is something especially Europe and Asia are very well aware of right now. And when North America is falling a little bit behind, I'm sorry. Here's the CEO of the port saying just that. These big tanks are full of hydrogen because we also stopped by Esbjerg's Power to X facility. Now let's take a moment to understand what that does. Power to X turns electricity into fuels, heat and chemicals that can be stored and used later. Here's how it works step by step. We start by taking the electricity generated from a wind turbine, which is otherwise quite difficult to save and store. Then the electricity is used to split water through electrolysis. The water is split into hydrogen gas and oxygen. The 
oxygen is simply released into the air, but the hydrogen is highly useful. And this is why it's called power to X, because the X is whatever the hydrogen is turned into or used as. So we have power to gas, where hydrogen is used for heating or fuel. We have power to liquid, where the hydrogen is used as synthetic fuels for planes and ships and cars. There's power to chemicals, which means the hydrogen is turned into fertilizers or plastic. And then there's power to heat, where we're directing heat into buildings or industry. And sometimes the hydrogen is even reconverted back into electricity for when there's no sun or wind. This is still very new and young technology. It's very promising, but it makes sense to not put all our eggs in one basket. But it is a very helpful tool. Optimizing the type of electricity we generate from wind or solar and other renewable sources and reusing them in other spaces can actually also help stabilize the energy grid. The easiest way to understand what power to x is actually doing is by this analogy that I I saw somewhere. I don't remember who said it first. If we imagine renewable energy being fresh milk, oat milk, of course, it's great. It just spoils rather easily. Power to X then turns the milk into something like cheese or yogurt, which has a longer shelf life, but also increases the value. That's extremely broadly what's happening. So how does wind power compare to fossil fuels? This comprehensive analysis of the life cycle environmental emissions of wind and coal power, the study utilized an LCA approach to evaluate and compare the environmental impacts of wind and coal power generation. The study found that wind power emits approximately 4% of the carbon dioxide emissions associated with coal power per kilowatt hour of electricity generated. This massive reduction highlights the environmental benefits of wind energy over more traditional coal-fired power. But emission sources is quite important here. For wind power, most emissions occur during the manufacturing and construction phases, primarily due to the production of materials and the use of purchased electricity. Coal power emissions are predominantly from the operation and maintenance phases, mainly due to the continuous combustion of coal during electricity generation, which is where the main climate impact comes from. The burn of fossil fuels today is still the main leading cause of climate change. The environmental costs associated with wind power are concentrated on the construction stage, accounting for about 47% of the total environmental costs, whereas coal power's environmental costs are more evenly distributed throughout its life cycle. And because the impact comes from different stages, it's easy to pit a high production impact against coal and gas in order to discredit renewables. Very much like, ah, see, I told you, it's not that great. We might as well stick to coal and gas but there's more to it. Even with a higher production impact, there's a lot to be gained here. Wind power only emits 4% of the emissions which is associated with coal and gas. Remember the massive vessel in the beginning? Yeah, apparently it is an offshore wind farm installation vessel and we're about to go and see it from the inside. It was massive, with lifting capacity of 1,600 tons at a radius of 40 meters. The main installation hook here can reach 160 meters above the main deck, and this is what it looks like in action. We got a chance to talk to both the captain and the crew of the vessel to understand the work that goes into this sector and what it takes to secure renewable energy. Not gonna lie, I thought from afar this was an oil drilling platform or something, and maybe you thought that too. At least now we know it might be something completely different next time we see something like this in the horizon. But with vessels this massive, I cannot help but question the impact constructions like this have on the environment. And I am not the only one. This study from 2024 looks at the environmental impact of building offshore wind turbines. And one of the more glaring findings of the study was that they found a massive data gap of 68%, which means that the vast majority of the impact of offshore wind turbines on the environment are still pretty much unknown. Now, I don't want to say obviously, but obviously when you build massive constructions on the seabed like this, there is going to be an impact on the local environments there. I'm also not going to lie and say that the main focus of this trip that I was on was on the environmental impacts of wind turbines. It wasn't exactly the biggest focus, but it's my biggest focus because climate issues and environmental issues do go together. This trip was very much so geared towards an interest in the business part of it or the tech part of it, which we can learn something from. I just also want to maintain what my primary focus is and it very much felt like whenever we started talking about the environmental impacts of building these massive constructions, it was often disregarded as a silly interest in whatever random fish might be affected 
by the renewable energy sector. Whenever you bring up the environmental impact in a setting like this, it can very easily be interpreted as though you want to put the entire renewable innovation sector on hold until we find that damn fish a new home. At least that can be the vibe whenever you want to introduce environmental concerns into a climate-related discussion. But I don't think it's ridiculous to consider local environments and how humans interact with them. After all, these ecosystems are incredibly fragile and destroying them or breaking them down will also have a direct impact on humans. Disregarding the local environmental issues or fragile ecosystems is quite literally like burning the ground we walk on. But it goes without saying that the destruction of natural habitats and ecosystems, the biodiversity laws and disregard for environmental impacts is not solely a problem in the renewable energy sector. And what issues arise here can also be found in the fossil fuel sector. Just much, 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 much much worse. So the attentive viewer might have noticed that in the beginning of the video I mentioned what was technically recyclable in a wind turbine. However, what can be done and what is actually done isn't always quite the same. There is no doubt that wind turbines are much more recyclable today than they were 20 years ago, both because it's a bigger priority today, but also because the infrastructure to recycle them is much more readily available globally. The blades are most commonly made from glass fiber, which is quite a difficult material to recycle or reuse. Digging them down has been an industry standard. However, new legislation from 2025 prohibits this kind of disposal of blades. So new technologies to recycle the blades are becoming more readily available. Everything from the infrastructure making it possible to different types of solutions and chemicals that can dissolve the resins and epoxies that the glass fiber is made from. I think it's also important to note that the blades have a lifespan of roughly 20 to 30 years and especially the blades made from glass fiber is held together by an epoxy glue that can pose some issues here. It is technically possible to recycle but because the material is of very low value it's not necessarily the biggest priority still compared to other materials. The recycling process of the blades is also highly costly and energy intensive, which means that the carbon footprint of recycling them is also quite high. So there's neither an economic incentive nor an environmental benefit to recycling a lot of wind blades. So one of the solutions here is for the industry itself to create blades in a material that you can recycle that both has an economic and climate related benefit, because we don't really want recycling if the environmental impact of the recycling process is higher than creating new material. That doesn't really make sense. And luckily this is not just a pipe dream, this is actually something that's happening. So during my trip with Wind Europe, I asked you guys on Instagram what kind of aspects of renewable energy you are interested in and what questions you have specifically focusing on wind. And one of the questions that I kept seeing again and again was how long it takes for a wind turbine to offset its construction impact. How long does it have to be in use in order to offset the impact of building it. Which is a really good question, so let's take a look at it. So the time it takes for a wind turbine to offset its own construction impact is referred to as energy payback time or carbon payback time. To offset its production, construction, transportation, it takes between six months and one year. Offshore wind turbines are in nature more complex and as such it takes between one and two years for a wind turbine offshore to offset its own construction impact. So a typical onshore wind turbine requires between two to 500 megawatt hours to produce, but it can generate between 6,000 to 9,000 megawatt hours in a year, depending on the wind conditions. So landfills for wind blades are actually quite common to the point where I have seen a dump site in my local town. I don't know if we're able to get in, but I'm going to go there now and we're going to see if we can get in. I don't know if it's a closed off area, but we're gonna bike out there now and see if we can get closer to it. So I've been on this little road for a while and I see them now. They're right there. This might actually be the remains of the very first offshore wind farm in the world. It was taken down in 2017 and later it was uncovered that 1.1 tons of fiberglass blades ended up in a landfill in this area. The remaining parts, except from the blades, were reused and recycled but the fiberglass stays put here for God knows how long, I guess. If it's any constellation, the same manufacturers who put them here are now making completely recyclable blades with resin that can be dissolved and materials that can be reused. So hopefully we will see a lot less of this in the future. Okay, I'm 99% certain I went somewhere where I wasn't supposed to go. <laughs> I almost feel bad. I'm pretty sure I did something that wasn't quite allowed. Got out of there and then I shot the rest of my shots from the outside of the fence. Cool, 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 cool. And I feel like karma caught up with me because I 
tripped on the beach and uh, now my trousers are soaked. I learned my lesson, do not trespass. As I say and not as I do. And that is everything for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any feedback or questions, leave them in the comments down below and share with the group. And if you want more environmental and climate content, consider subscribing to this channel. That would also make my day. Thank you so much for watching. Have an amazing day and take really good care of yourselves. Until next time. Bye.